Good evening, or whatever time it may be where you are. On behalf of Naropa University and the Joanna Macy Center at Naropa, welcome. We have many people with us from around the country and around the world. I'm Sherry Elms, professor at Naropa and faculty lead for the Joanna Macy Center at Naropa. First, I would like to honor the land that Naropa inhabits, the First Nations people prior to European colonization. The Arapaho, the Cheyenne, the Apache, the Ute, the Kiowa. And let's just take a moment to honor the land. Thank you. It is only fitting we should have a special launch at Naropa University for a wild love for the world, Joanna Macy and the work of our times. Naropa University and Joanna have been in a collaborative dance in various ways for decades. It has been, a it has been and continues to be an evolution of learning, inspiring connection and expanding awareness and activity. Her root teachings of the work that reconnects her scholarly exposition of general systems theory and deep ecology profoundly bridges our Buddhist heritage with understanding and tools to radically confront the global upheaval we are witnessing. From the early days of Allen Ginsberg and the nonviolent civil disobedience actions around Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant to the present where community engagement still continues, her work is alive more than ever. And with the increased polarization, the economic upheaval, the social justice movement of Black Lives Matter, the impact of the pandemic and the underlying climate chaos, we are witnessing the great unraveling and the great turning, what her teachings have been preparing us for. Her teachings are alive today in our curriculum here, using her co-authored book, Active Hope, in a variety of programs in our BA curriculum, as well as as our master's programs in environmental studies and eco-psychology. And in fact, Dr. James Beachy is already using Wild Love for the World as a primary text this semester in her chaplaincy internship course. So this evening, we continue the dance and it has only just begun. I would now like to turn it over to Stephanie Kaza, the editor of the book, who had the inspiration and commitment to bring forth the remarkable scope of Joanna Macy's work. She is Professor Emerita of Environmental Studies at the University of Vermont and the author of several books herself on Buddhism and ecology. So Stephanie, take it away. Hello everyone. My name is Stephanie Kaza and I will be the moderator for this celebration and I'm the editor for this book project. Just five months ago, we celebrated the launch of this new book on Joanna's 91st birthday. A, a rather immense five months, it seems, between the pandemic, the climate fires and floods, and the outpouring of support for racial justice. I'm speaking to you from the watersheds of the Columbia and Willamette Rivers, and I want to acknowledge and honor the indigenous people on whose ancestral land I sit the Multnomah, Clackamas, Klawiwala, and Cascades or Watlala bands of Chinookan peoples and the Tualatin band of Kalapuya. Though we are meeting in Zoom cyberspace, please know that we are living, breathing, three-dimensional, warm, loving beings embedded in and shaped by our home places, our ancestors, our cultures, and our times. There are mountains and rivers and trees and neighborhoods behind and within us. I have recently returned from participating in a writing retreat with Joanna up here at Kay's Farm in Trout Lake, Washington. It was a thrill to be working together again and you might wonder what is Joanna up to now? We are putting together an updated and newly invigorated 30th anniversary edition of one of Joanna's favorite books, World as Lover, World as Self. If all goes well, that book should be out next May, 2021 from Parallax Press. 
As for a wild love for the world, I want you to know this book is filled with joy. What Joanna calls Arbeitsfreudigkeit or work joyfulness. The timing of this book's arrival in the midst of such an evolutionary moment is striking. What gifts might this book bring for all of us as we find our way to the new world that will be born out of this time? We will hear first from our four a dialogue panelists and then have time for questions from our audience, which you can submit through the chat box. Joanna will then close our program with her current thoughts on what lies ahead. Let me begin by introducing our panelists in order. First is Sherry Elms, Associate Professor at Naropa University. She teaches in resilient leadership, environmental studies and eco-psychology, and she has helped to create the Joanna Macy Center to quote, empower present and future generations in building a more resilient world that works for all. She works at the intersection of nature contemplative practice, and social and ecological justice. David Abram is a cultural ecologist and geophilosopher based in New Mexico, who lectures and teaches widely on several continents. He is the author of Becoming Animal and Earthly Cosmology and The Spell of the Sensuous, Perception and Language in a More Than Human World. Kathleen Sullivan is a disarmament educator, author, activist, and producer who has been engaged in nuclear issues for the last 30 years. She is the founder of the Hibakusha Stories Project and a founding member of ICANN, which won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Janine Canty is professor and chair of environmental studies at Naropa University with specialties in eco-psychology, environmental and climate justice, and intersecting systems of oppression, race, class, environmental. Canty is the editor and contributing author for Ecological and Social Healing, Multicultural Women's Voices. And last, Paula Green has 40 years of experience as a psychologist, peace educator, consultant, and mentor in intergroup relations and conflict resolution. She founded the Karuna Center for Peacebuilding and is Professor Emerita at the School for International Training in Brattleboro, Vermont, where she initiated the Conflict Transformation Across Cultures program. So thank you again, Sherry, for introducing our program. And now I will turn it over to David Abram. Well, it's a terrific pleasure to join you all today to say a few words about the work of my elder sister, Joanna Macy, whose wild and bodacious love for this blooming, buzzing, storm-swept wonder of a world has nourished our work and our activism and has fed my own soul for such a long time. At the lustrous heart of Joanna's life work and practice lies the Buddha's jewel-like insight into the truth of pratitya samutpada, or dependent co-arising, a principle that Joanna translated as mutual causality in her splendid doctoral dissertation on the Dharma of natural systems, and which in this book goes under a wide array of names, emergent co-arising, reciprocal causality, dependent co-origination, or even the deceptively simple notion that everything leans, that is each apparently autonomous thing actually leans upon everything else. But I heard the most remarkably elegant, grounded, and mind-blowing elucidation of this principle, first in the early 1980s, when I was driving along a rutted road, a dirt road in the outer suburbs of New York City, my right hand fiddling with the radio dial in hopes of finding some decent songs to listen to. As the sound skidded from one station to another, I abruptly heard a clear and curious voice not exactly singing, but definitely sing-song, lilting up and down. I stopped turning the dial and I just listened. At a brief station break, the woman being interviewed was identified as Joanna Macy, 
a Buddhist scholar and activist. And then there was that an unusual voice again, breathy with a slightly nasal twang, saying something astonishingly simple. You know, the oxygen we need to breathe is precisely what all the green plants around us are breathing out. So what the plants breathe out, all of us are breathing in. And then what we breathe out is just what all those plants need to breathe in. Whoa, I pulled the car over to the side of the road in order to think about this. Was this true? I mean, I knew that the oxygen in the atmosphere was generated by plants. And I also knew plenty well that we and the other animals breathe out carbon dioxide as a byproduct of our own respiratory metabolism. But I'd been taught these as two entirely separate mechanical processes. Somehow I had never noticed how mutually entangled these two activities were. Joanna's simple articulation in that radio broadcast has never left me. It was so dumbfoundingly obvious, something most of us already knew, although the detached jargon of the academy had blocked us from noticing the utter wonder of the thing. What the plants are breathing out, all of us animals are breathing in. And what we animals are breathing out, all the plants are breathing in. The exquisite reciprocity here remains astonishing to me, even today, a magic pulse of interspecies generosity quietly unfurling itself in the depths of the present moment, hidden at the heart of all our experience. Of course, so many meditative practices central to the great spiritual traditions work to gently bring our skittish attention back to the simple to and fro of our breathing. The very word spirit is cognate with the word respiration, both derived from the Latin spiritus, which originally meant a breath or a gust of wind. Yet spiritual practice in the West is commonly framed as a path to personal fulfillment, as a way to find oneself or to transcend one's suffering, or simply as a way to open and deepen one's inner life. How often have you found yourselves seated at the foot of Buddhist teachers who skillfully draw practitioners to an awareness of the breath sliding in and out of their nostrils? And yet somehow these teachers never connect that breath to the herbs and the trees drinking sunlight all around you, breathing out the oxygen that you're breathing in. Even when teaching out of doors, the most ostensibly awake spiritual teachers commonly fail to notice, much less make explicit for their students, the seamless continuity between their breath and the encompassing atmosphere, roiling with birdsong and clouds of pollen from the trees. But clearly, this is where Joanna Macy begins. For her, the focus on the breath is not just a way of quieting the mind, but a way of awakening to our utter entanglement with one another, our interbeing with the soils and the oceans, a way of noticing our interbreathing with the ponderosa pines and the aspen groves and the sagebrush. And so Joanna's understanding of spiritual wisdom carries us not inside ourselves, but out into the depths of the earthly sensuous. For Joanna, the real inner world is the world that we are in bodily, the world in which we're corporeally immersed along with all these other bodies, black bears, earthworms, sea turtles tangled in plastic, owl haunted forests and rapidly eroding slopes strewn with clear cut debris. And so it is here in the collective depths of this world where we grapple and struggle and gather to dance, where we grieve the harrowing losses and then stand shoulder to shoulder to protect children and battered refugees and to safeguard the wild flourishing beauty that remains. It's here in the improvisational thick of the real that we must practice our spiritual work. I don't know if you folks remember that the origin of the Gaia hypothesis, the original seed of James Lovelock's assertion that the earth 
needed to be reconceptualized as a living being came from his studies of the atmosphere. He noticed that the chemical composition of Earth's atmosphere was very far from equilibrium, that there were various chemicals present that should be canceling each other out, and yet they didn't. Somehow the atmosphere stayed in this very far from equilibrium composition continually. And it's then he realized that the atmosphere was being steadily generated, monitored, and modulated by all of the organic life on Earth's surface acting together, breathing together as an immense spherical physiology. The air, our breath, is the very signature of a living planet, this living elixir born of our interbreathing with the other animals and the plants and the soils. Why does this matter? Well, think of this outrageous era we're living through, this teetering moment in this whirling dervish of a world. What is the most common, most emblematic refrain echoing out of the chaos of this moment? It's the anguished last words of George Floyd as a knee looking very much like my own knee presses down on his neck. I can't breathe, which weirdly echoes the voices in so many intensive care units across this nation and across the world today. Voices of those whose lungs have suddenly been ravaged by an illness unheard of just a few months ago. I can't breathe which also echoes the voices of so many in California, in Oregon, Washington, these last many weeks, voices of sisters and brothers who step out their doors into billowing gray black clouds of smoke from rampaging wildfires, crying, I can't breathe, and having to retreat indoors, their cry echoing that of so many courageous Black Lives Matter protesters finding themselves wrapped in clouds of tear gas. Ah, I can't breathe. Flaring forest fires and never before seen hurricanes and deepening droughts, all fed by our long forgetting of the invisible air, the unseen breath, by our taking, take, by our taking for granted the invisible fluid element born of our interbreathing with one another all fed by our treating the air as just empty space, as a dump site, as an open sewer in which to toss all of the toxic effluent of our industries, all the exhaust from our carbon guzzling engines, our coal and gas fired power plants. Here's Joanna's translation with Anita Barrows of a stanza from one of Rilke's sonnets to Orpheus. She says, Breath, you invisible poem, pure continuous exchange with all that is, flow and counterflow where rhythmically I come to be. But of course, it's not just our treatment of the air and these waters. It's also our callous treatment of one another the multiple atrocities of the 20th century provide abundant evidence of our human propensity when economies falter for too long, when crops fail or famine spreads, for polarization and scapegoating, for ethnic cleansing and genocide. No matter how advanced or refined the culture, whenever times get tough, the most facile human response seems to be to locate some group to blame for all the troubles and then try to eradicate them or failing that to inflict upon them as much pain as possible. And yet it's now evident that things will be getting hard for a very long while due to our long forgetting of our human embedment within a much more than human biosphere, it now seems probable that melting glaciers, scorching wildfires, turning the midday sun blood red, surging floodwaters overtopping levees, never before seen winds and soil cracking heat waves, heat waves will be making things more and more difficult well beyond the foreseeable future as our womish world shivers into a bone-wrenching fever. In such a situation, shouldn't we expect 
that the unconscious allurement toward demagoguery and scapegoating will swell and intensify. In such stressed out times as these, those who want to garner crowds and concentrate power have only to declare with great certainty whom the enemy is. They have only to amp up the fear and then escalate hatred in order to rapidly amass countless followers. Such is the collective psychology of this moment in the world's unraveling when the ecological strains on our civilization are poised to intensify by the year, by the month, and soon enough by the day. The current occupant of the White House and the crowd in flaming rage he cannot resist sowing with evident glee may not at all be an aberration, but simply an early glimpse of what is rolling toward us. Not inevitably, no, yet an early symptom or sign of what may soon show itself more fully as our most ready mass response to rapidly rising panic. So how can we short circuit this reflexive recourse to scapegoating whenever adversity rolls like a great wave across numberless lives and fear rises like a tide within the populace? Surely this is one of the greatest riddles of our broken era, a koan that demands our deepest and most attentive contemplation. If there exists anywhere a satisfactory reply to this conundrum, it likely resides in such earth-centered community practices as Joanna Macy's work has engendered. It likely resides in the dawning recognition of our thorough entanglement in this breathing biosphere, in the slow discovery that our lives are hopelessly dependent upon one another, but also upon the flourishing of earthworms and humpback whales and the clouds that gather like a clamorous crowd above the rainforest. If we and the melting glaciers inter are with one another, if the life-giving atmosphere of this planet is born of the interbreathing of us animals with the grasses and the forests, then it behooves us to recognize that our two-legged forms are just our smaller bodies and that the animate earth is our larger flesh, a huge spherical metabolism in which our individual physiologies are all entwined. Earth is the wider and much wilder life in which our separate lives all participate, of which each unique entity, a spinning spider, an aspen grove, a human being is but an internal expression. Well, how fleeting is anyone's experience relative to the broad lifespan of the planet? And yet we each partake of that whole Indeed, there are those who give themselves so deeply to this world, who open their soul so fully to each chance encounter, who so thoroughly resolve not to shrink from any of the uncanny textures or flavors or feels that this life offers, that from these many encounters, their heart distills a mysterious wine, an invisible elixir that streams out through their eyes to refresh all that they look upon, waking a secret and long slumbering sentience in things, quickening a pulse deep within the ground, wherever they wander. Such a magical creature is Joanna Macy. If you read among the various chapters in this new book, you might find yourself wondering how it's possible that a single human life can have touched and transformed so many other lives in so many different places. But this is hardly a mystery. By offering herself so unconditionally to each locale and situation wherein she finds herself, Joanna's life radiates out to touch and enliven every cell within our larger spherical body. By giving herself with such abandon to the very presence of the present moment. Joanna's tears and her joy, like those of any genuine bodhisattva, reverberate backward in time and forward in time to nourish each moment within the broad life of the breathing earth. Thanks so much.
Joanna. Thank you so much, David. We're, it's, it's rather spellbinding to listen to your poetic description of Joanna and your real, true experience of her as an elder sister. It's a beautiful thing. Well, from interbreathing with oxygen and carbon dioxide, there is also this matter of nuclear waste and how it has shaped Naropa and shaped the work that Sherry has written about I mean, that uh, Kathleen has written about, excuse me, for this book. So Kathleen, um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I just, I want to say, David, wow. Um, and, you know, to, to uh, draw on another um, of Joanna's translations of Rilke, if the drink is bitter, turn yourself to wine. Um, you know, let us drink the wine of this moment. It is intense. It is bitter and intense. And um, it, is, it is also beautiful. Uh, I, I want to um, say something about the word gift, which in German means poison. And for us in English means something that you present to another um, you know, with love and celebration. And so in a sense, the plutonium that was created by human hands to be used uh, as a, a weapon of um, omnicide, an instrument of omnicide um, that wages war on future generations is also in a sense, a gift to us because it proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that we are all interconnected, we are all interrelated. Because when plutonium gets into the earth, into the water, into the land, into human bodies, it becomes a part of us. And it is our responsibility to care for that and pass that to future generations. Um, of course, I'm speaking of Joanna and Fran Macy's uh, beautiful gift to the world, gift of gift of nuclear guardianship. And my um, encounter, my first encounter of Joanna was aptly um, at the Bethlehem Center in 1989. That's where I found my North Star, Joanna Macy. And, uh, you know, that was a time in my life, I was an undergraduate at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I had been a um, anti-nuclear activist uh, as a high school student, but strangely, uh, I'd never heard the word plutonium before. And then I moved out to Boulder to find that I was living uh, close uh, to the world's largest concentration of plutonium at that time. Um, and I was going back and forth to my family home in Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I'm Zooming to you right now. Um, although I live in New York City. Um, and I was saying to, to my father in particular, um, you know, there's this crazy place, it's called Rocky Flats, they're making plutonium, it is contaminating the water, people are getting sick. And he said that you're just crazy, this would never happen, this country um, would not let that happen. And uh, later that year, he was on a business trip in Germany, and he uh, was getting ready for some arranged um, appointment and he was watching the the international news and they said we're now going to bring you to the most dangerous place on the planet rocky flats <laughs> um you know my father sent me a telegram from germany apologizing that he did not believe me um my spiritual parents uh joanna and fran macy um, instilled a courage and a belief in me and in the work that we share, um, which has lasted all of these decades. And I just feel so um, enormously privileged to have been on this long journey. The um, gift of guardianship, the, the awareness of the poison, is making the invisible visible. And David, I thank you again for your words because so much of what you just said is making the invisible visible and for us to acknowledge that. And again, in the reversal of that, to see our interrelatedness and our interconnection in the suffering that we are feeling um, personally in this time of uh, 
this intense separation. You know, the COVID is uh, so much in many ways like um, it, it has a nuclearism about it, you know, because it happened so quickly and everything changed. And I think that that's something that we don't um, walk around with a, a sort of daily realization of this fact that nuclear weapons are a threat every moment of every day to everything and everyone we love, every moment of every day. And in, in, in a flash, you know, a, an entire city can be wiped from the face of the planet, um, you know, with all the beauty and the culture and the people and the beings, um, you know, it's really hard to imagine, but in a strange way, the gift, the poison of COVID uh, is revealing that to us. You know, who would have thought that we would not be able to be together? Um, who would have thought that we would not be able to simply hug one another, to be with our loved ones, to, to run to their side? Um, you know, it's, it's very, it's a profound moment that we're in. And um, I think that it reflects a lot on what I learned um, over these decades from Joanna and also from Fran, who I really want to presence this evening. Um, what a beautiful, generous soul uh, that Joanna and Fran brought to us this work where we confront that most intense, um, most earth shattering, most time shattering uh, poison that is uh, plutonium and the byproducts of nuclear weapons and nuclear power technology. Um, I was very privileged as a young person to uh, meet Joanna. And uh, I quickly you know, decided that, uh, well, I wanted to see her again. So I was working at the Rocky, Flat, Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center um, in Boulder with Leroy Moore. Um, before that, I was working at a Freeze Voter with Judith Mulling, both who remain uh, dear colleagues and very central to the Rocky Flats Nuclear Guardianship Project. And funnily enough, in 1989, that same year, I found myself um, traveling to California with the Rocky Flats slideshow. This is when Rocky Flats was still, you know, pumping out plutonium pits, and um, it was still the most dangerous place. Uh, oh, but that uh, that uh, news flash was when um, John Lipsky, the FBI agent, raided Rocky Flats. Because what we were saying, what activists were saying, um, what uh, people that were connected to CU and Naropa, um, the, the, the tradition, um, were saying that, you know, they're, they were burning plutonium contaminated waste. And um, there was a lot of uh, danger out there that was being ignored and, um, you know, really endangering the, the, the people and the, the, the ecosystem. Uh, so John Lipsky was the lead FBI agent that um, busted Rocky Flats. It was the first time in U.S. history that we had one government, U.S. government agency busting another. John Lipsky is also a part of the Rocky Flats Nuclear Guardianship Project. So the story um, is, goes back decades. It comes back to the present moment. Um, and in that uh, earlier iteration in the 80s, when I was able to go out to California with this Rocky Flats slideshow, um, I met Joanna again. She invited me to her home in the Berkeley Hills. And um, we, had a, we had a lovely lunch of artichoke. I still remember that's very important to me because I love artichoke and so does Joanna. Um, and... Uh, I was then brought into the uh, nuclear guardianship concept. This was a very um, nascent moments of, of that uh, beautiful gift to the world that Joanna and Fran brought to us. Um, I was able to later visit and go to a uh, fire group meeting. And that gave me a real sense of um, the profundity of the deep time practices that Joanna would be developing the sort of uh, use of our imagination so that we could think about future generations and how we would convey this story because there was no way that we were going to be able to um, solve it 
You know, that was actually the first um, one of uh, many liberating moments, which was to say, there's no solution to this. There is no solution. Because hiding behind the idea that we're going to someday, somehow, we're going to figure out how to transmute this. We're going to put it in glass. You know, we're going to make further energy out of it. Uh, we're going to, you know, distill it into whatever. It, it all just perpetuates the lie. So the first liberation of basically saying there's no solution. So then what? So then what is education? It's creating art. It's creating culture. It's using the most um, base level technology to monitor the nuclear materials and keep them from the environment, but you do it in an incredibly active way so that that's passed from one generation to the next. Um, so that was also very profound because instead of this sort of like great um, sort of idea that science was gonna fix it and you know it was gonna be this sort of um, continued idea of our dominion over nature, we were just gonna get that done, meant that we could continue um, creating this poison without taking care of it. So that there is no such thing as disposal was something else that Joanna you know, really gave to us that there is no away, we are here. Everything that we've ever created is here with us and we can take responsibility for that or we can ignore it to our peril. It's a gift, the poison, the present, the gift to the future, the gift of the future that we um, can connect to future generations through um, this profound um, allegiance over time. Because even though we will one day get rid of nuclear weapons, I am very happy to report that the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons has at this point um, uh, 46 ratifications. We need 50 for it to enter into force. That's something that I can talk about further or just send you links with. Um, but I just see that my time is up and um, I didn't get to Naropa at all. Those beautiful people that I mentioned earlier, all inspired by the work of Joanna and Fran, would later come together in 2011 to start the Rocky Flats Nuclear Guardianship uh, Project, um, which is, is still uh, going strong and certainly buoyed by the Joanna Macy Center at Naropa. And I would just finally say that um, what we see right now outside at Rocky Flats is the reverse of guardianship. We see Candelis, we see the housing projects, we see people saying, oh, come and have a beautiful life out west in the Mount foothills of Colorado and raise your children here. And we know that there is plutonium in that soil. We know that that will hurt the people that are living there right now. But on a bluff outside the Rocky Flats, what was the Rocky Flats plant, plutonium factory sits Jeff Gipes Cold War horse. And that is the guardian present there now looking over that plateau and saying, here lies a danger. And we still have the opportunity to take care of that and to remember the gift that we have been given that we will bequeath to future generations. And finally to say, Joanna, the gift that you have given to us, the interconnection with all life into the future and how in taking care of that, we come home to ourselves and we come home to each other. I love you, I bow to you, and I thank you. Oh, thank you, Kathleen, thank you. Thank you for all the work you've done with the Hibakusha survivors, with the guardianships projects, for committing your whole life to this. It's a beautiful and inspiring thing, and I so appreciate your chapter. And I just want to make a quick shout out here of a brand new book about Rocky Flats called Doom with a View. It just came out mm -hmm. and um, it's uh, edited by Kristen Iverson. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have a copy right there, but a toast to that. <laughs> and if you're interested in more on Rocky Flats, you, you can definitely learn a lot. I just got that book. It's going to be very educational. So let's shift gears now to another piece in the book um, with Janine Canty and uh, some other perspectives about how to see this interconnectedness. 
Thank you, Stephanie um, and Joanna and Kathleen and David and Paula and Sherry. Um, it's just an honor to be included um, as part of this uh, book and as part of the work that reconnects. And as I've been watching the community of who's here right now um, in this call, it just, I felt really teary and heartfelt to see how many faces I know and to remember that we are part of this um, work and we are connected. Uh, it's important to remember since so many of us are um, feeling separate right now. And uh, as Stephanie said, I'm a, a professor at Naropa and I, so I'm living in the foothills of Boulder, Colorado and loving it here and also just recognizing, I want to start off acknowledging um, those suffering from fires, from the pandemic, um, all the suffering that's happening right now, which is immense. Um, and also acknowledge the tragic losses and brutal losses of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Trayvon Martin, Laquan McDonald, Freddie Gray, Eric Gardner, Ayanna Stanley Jones, Botham Jean, Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, Bland, Yvette Smith, Alton Sterling, David McAtee, Walter Scott, Brianna Taylor, Tamara Rice, Alondro Castillo, Stephen Clark, Jacob Blake, Elijah McLean, and all of the tragically countless, countless other Black brothers, sisters, and folk. Um, and definitely, um, as Sherry did in her opening, acknowledge the First Nations people of this area, um, the Ute and the Arapaho and the Cheyenne. And uh, I always lately really feel the importance of acknowledging all of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and um, all of the people uh, within the U.S. that are fearing alienation, deportation, and both structural and physical violence. And of course, acknowledging the earth and all of the species and places suffering right now and acknowledging our ancestors. Um, when I was looking at this earlier, I was recognizing that the list of black folk um, that were murdered through Bruce police brutality reminded me of the list um, Joanna has in Coming Back to Life, the bestiary of all the endangered species. And it was really um, hitting home. And hopefully there'll be a time in the future where we won't have these lists. Um, I started studying Joanna's work in the mid 1990s. And I was actually um, working and also studying at uh, Prescott College in Arizona. And my eco-psychology teacher, Laura Sewell, came back from a retreat with Joanna. And she had um, an actual cassette tape and she put it in a boom box. And we started walking around the room and Joanna's, um, similar to what David was saying about Joanna's voice came on and she was doing some of the early work that reconnects um, exercises. And I was just um, blown, blown out of my mind. And I said, wow, this is really cool. And um, during that time, I was um, doing a lot of work around multicultural education. And I was teaching for the first time, I was teaching a class on multicultural education and I was also deeply immersed in studying eco-psychology. And both of those things felt separate at the time. They were both different um, kind of spectrums, but both of them for me really centered around how do we change the minds and actions of adults when they're closed-minded, when they're not seeing these issues. Um, both racism and ecological destruction. And so that was something that really got me um, searching. So that 
psychology of change, that um, transformation. And so uh, during that time, I had come across uh, in, in the same book, Coming Back to Life, Joanna has a list of the causes. Joanna and in partnership with Molly Young Brown, of course, uh, the surrounding the causes and consequences for denying and repressing um, the ecological crisis. And some of those, I know um, probably almost everyone on this Zoom has read them, and if not, you should. Uh, but some of the reasons, uh, including not wanting to experience despair, guilt, uh, looking at the gloomy reality of the crisis, not wanting to seem anti-American, causing others distress, and seeming irrational, emotional, and weak, or simply associating these feelings with personal problems rather than the state of the world. And uh, so I was mixing these things in, and I was also looking a lot at the work of um, Milton Bennett and the stages that we go through with um, stages of intercultural sensitivity. And uh, those are going from basically from denial, defense, minimization, and moving up to acceptance, and finally into um, adaptation, integration. And these developmental frameworks were really helpful in engaging this work. And when I was teaching around multicultural education, I had a lot of backlash from um, a couple of the students. And it was an all white class. And I was only in my uh, late 20s at the time and kind of trying to hold my own. And I realized uh, that the same list of why people uh, don't want to look and address the ecological crisis applied to why people don't want to look at racism, um, not wanting to be anti-American, not wanting to cause others distress, not seeming irrational emotionally and weak, not looking at those gloomy realities. So these things uh, went completely hand in hand. So I was able to take a lot of these models and frameworks and even exercises and actually do them um, with work around racism. So I am always thankful around that. And I had the um, blessing of spending time with Joanna over the last 12 years or so, um, whenever she comes to Naropa. And I'm always just so thankful. Um, whenever she comes, she always, I always get a phone call from her assistant that she wants to know, have dinner or um, sit together. And I, I feel so special, like, oh, Joanna wants to see me. Um, like, really, how does she have the time to have so many mentees and people that she looks out for? So I wanted to um, close with just reading a section of um, the essay I have in the book. It's called Ecological and Social Justice Healing. And this brings together um, the work that I've been doing. An important concept emphasized in both eco-psychology and deep ecology, as well as by Joanna Macy, is the ecological self. Um, the term indicates a process of maturation where a person extends their identity from an ego-centered self to a social self, and finally, to a more metaphysical or ecological self that connects with aspects of both the visible and unseen natural world. And uh, Macy often calls this the greening of the self through widening circles of interrelatedness. In my work, I connect the ecological self to that of the multicultural self. And one of my mentors, Carl Anthony, introduces the multicultural self as the need to learn the stories of diverse peoples in order to decenter whiteness and the Western dominant paradigm. Uh, Anthony defines the multicultural self as the capacity for empathy with many people and cultures, and also with our capacity for empathy with living creatures. The parallels of these concepts are extremely important for our ability to expand our limited egos um, 
identities so dominant in our society to ones that hold the widest perspectives. And this is the heart of compassionate action. And one thing I truly appreciate is Joanna Macy's ability to sometimes step into the mess of getting things wrong about social injustice, particularly race, and to take the feedback and address it. The work that reconnects will always need to be open to making mistakes and learning from this. And this is an essential aspect of reciprocity, action, and healing. If we bring together the concepts of these various broken identities and capacities for expanding our worldviews, our sense of self, a person who holds both a multicultural self and an ecological self has immense power to see and act outside our dominant worldview that purports social and ecological oppression and instead move to a life affirming paradigm. And so uh, I think we're all aware of uh, Joanna and others um, term of the great turning and we are sure in it. And it feels often that we're in the like the heavy, messy, um, disastrous, um, depressing part of it. Um, yet there's also so much new light, um, new actions, um, alternative structures emerging that um, many of us are not even aware of. And um, it seems like there's this balance of um, dispelling the division and separateness and these singled issued fixities, fixedness that we're seeing in our time and really stepping into the connection, courage, action, and grace. And that grace part seems so important with surrendering to something that's so much bigger than any of us and even all of us. Um, and that's where um, I'm finding the work right now. So um, thank you, Joanna and Stephanie and everyone here. Um, I feel really, really blessed. Oh, thank you, Janine. I, I wish I were there with you in Boulder right now. And uh, the pain of being separate makes it really difficult, but we're, we are here together in cyberspace, and I hope for the people listening that you can feel that our hearts are connected, even if our bodies are a little bit out of reach of each other. So um, in this time of chaos that we've been uh, describing in many different forms, where our fourth panelist has worked in peace building her whole life, and I thought that would be a good way to close this evening as a uh, it's a, a practice we can make, it's a skill we need, and someone with some wise elder experience might uh, help us believe it's possible. So, Paula? Thank you, Stephanie, and hello, Joanna, my soul sister, Stephanie, my other soul sister, and all of you out here for your lovely presentations. It's a very rich evening. I'm going to talk about peace building and conflict transformation. This will be a very different presentation from the others, and I hope it will be of interest to you. I'm going to talk about the unique and wonderful and creative ways that people have taken Joanna's core teachings and adapted them. The section of the book that I'm going to talk about is called On the Move Together. There are seven authors. Each author has a tremendously different way of picking up what Joanna did and taking it forward. One person follows Joanna by teaching consciousness raising and teaching the great turning in California. That's Sean. Adrian works in Latin America as an echo psychologist trying to help Latinos deal with their cultural legacy. And Sarah is an echo chaplain, another new profession evolving out of Joanna's work and working in North Carolina. And Zilong Wang teaches Joanna's work in China, where he says that he gets a wonderful reception and that's very heartening to hear. Susan Moon is a writer. Matthew Fox needs no introduction. He's taken Joanna's work into his own domain of creation and liberation, spirituality. And I'm going to give him the last word in this little summation. Um, my own work has taken me all over the world. I've been privileged to become 
an international peace builder. I work in this country, but I also work in Asia, Africa, Eastern Europe, um, the Middle East, and um, I've been doing it for decades in very difficult circumstances, mostly right after war, because before war, nobody knows they need to resolve conflicts and during war can't resolve conflicts, but right after war is when I'm usually called in. Joanna has been with me from the beginning as I travel and teach. Actually, if I could call my work by its true name, I would call it waking up, to quote Thich Nhat Hanh about true names, because waking up is what I'm seeking to do. I call it peace building and conflict transformation because then you can get a master's degree and get international funding, but it's really, really about waking up. It's, um, it's about the hallmark of Joanne's teaching about interdependence. That's what I'm hoping people will wake up to. Its purpose is to help us break through the walls of separation that we have created because the separation is delusional and it's based on fear. Our longings, all of our longings for safety and security, belonging and recognition, respect, health and welfare and love, and a healthy earth upon which to thrive are common and shared across all cultures and all geographies everywhere. There's no separation. The problems surface in the details of how we get there and how we share the abundance equitably. It is the human story. The communities that I work with have made themselves blind to this story. Instead, they've waged war on their neighbors and fellow citizens. After a lot of thinking about this over decades, I believe these destructive behaviors arise from mind states taught by the Buddha as ignorance, greed, and anger. The Buddha nailed those three poisons precisely for international peace building. I observe repeatedly that these are the deepest causes of our armed conflicts and our endless life-destroying enmity. After the guns are silenced, shaken and shattered group members coming from all sides of a conflict say, how did we do this to ourselves? How did we let this happen? Where were we? These are lessons for now for all of us brothers and sisters. And as we brainstorm the symptoms, the synonyms um, of greed, anger, and ignorance, we fill up whiteboards, boards, and flip charts, and we come up with whatever Joanna came up with before, mutual arising causalities. But we call it conflict analysis. But that's exactly what it is. We see, for example, what happens from greed. It manifests as anxiety, insecurity, it expresses itself through craving, competition, selfishness, materialism, and ruthlessness. Anger. Anger shows itself through hatred, judgment, racism and xenophobia, murderous rage, and ignorance. Ignorance is delusional. Ignorance is not seeing, not knowing, remaining asleep and oblivious to our condition as interdependent creatures. All of it rolls together and is heated up by the great fire of fear until it becomes a dangerous brew. We could use some antidotes for those three poisons in our own country right now. We are caught in our own, own, own brew of ignorance and avarice. We seem unable to recognize and respect the historic and social bonds that entangle us. We are confronted once again with racial turmoil based on the dominant culture's collective refusal thus far to even acknowledge, let alone repair and repay, the harms caused by four centuries of oppression. The need for waking up cannot wait. We are on a precipice. In response, some trained by Joanna are using their, her work as their guiding light for essential racial reckoning and awakening. Others for bridging divides. Many are called to address the utter despair and angst of this election season in implementing any of these variations of the work that reconnects. Joanna's rituals play a major part. Ritual is my last topic and a vitally important one 
that makes Joanna, frankly, a creative genius for me. It's not just the depth of her theoretical and insightful learning and the intense love in her presence, although that would be enough. It's the processes by which she delivers her insights and passions. Look what she has invented. The Council of All Beings. Letters from the future. Harvesting the gifts of the ancestors. Invoking the beings of other times. The dance to dismember the ego. The truth mandala. The despair ritual. The great turning. The great ball of merit. Who else could have conjured up these titles? develop these process for awakening, letting go of lectures and scolding and guilt tripping. Instead, she turns everyone upside down on their heads so we can see with new eyes, hear with new ears, love with new awareness, and go forth to act with her own fearlessness and determination. That's what gets us hooked. That's the theory in action in blood and guts on the floors of workshop spaces worldwide. That's the work of transformation. For 20 years, I led a program I created called CONTACT, an acronym for conflict transformation across cultures. We brought together two times annually, groups of up to 60 participants, almost all from war zones, for two to three week residential intensives. You can imagine what's in that circle. For that to be successful, I felt I had to channel Joanna and plumb the depth of her teaching genius. I developed my own version of the Council of All Beings. Let's call it the Council of All Human Beings. I based it on witnessing repeatedly that human communities make choices in responding to conflict to either take revenge or pursue avenues to restore and strengthen their common lives. Sadly, most choose revenge or don't choose deliberately, but just follow the erroneous path of believing they can relieve their own pain by inflicting pain on those they perceive threaten them. In this way, endless cycles of revenge plague the regions. The residents are trapped and unaware that another world is possible. So on a large open floor with tape and newsprints, we create a massive diagram of a huge double wheel. The inside wheel is a cycle of revenge. There's no escape, it's a closed cycle. The series of stages we name include shock, disbelief, and denial about the war, humiliation and guilt for one's part in the war, realization of loss, dehumanization of the enemy, and the development of an I'm good and they are bad narrative. On the outer open cycle that leads toward reconciliation, some of the stages are incur mourning and expressing grief required in all cultures, memorializing our losses, rehumanizing the enemy, and developmentally further along, re-engagement with the identified other toward mutuality and restoration. Each group member, this is the ritual part, through meditation, music, and slow, silent moving, finds the courage to identify where on the cycle they belong right now in their lives and to sit down quietly and wait. Each then speaks in turn with lots of anguish, lots of grief, lots of despair. Everyone in these groups, no matter their re region or religion or political affiliation, has lived through that heaviness. Together we listen, witness, hug, and console. Then we move on to hear from others who in some way have begun the journey toward managing their anger, confronting their fears, and reaching out to explore the root causes of the war that almost destroyed their lives and souls. The ritual takes all day and results in the recognition that war takes away everything everything that is, except our capacity to respond to evil with our own hard-won compassion, resilience, determination, and love. And recognizing the suffering that happens on all sides in armed conflict. As Joanna taught us, there was no other, neither human nor different species nor Mother Earth. We are all connected 
And only by acknowledging and embracing this vast web can we collectively survive and thrive. I want to end with words from Matthew Fox in the book, The Tribute to Joanna. In a wild love for the world, he writes, may the profound work of this gorgeous, courageous, wise and wild Buddhist woman never be forgotten or ignored. It will flourish in generations to come. It will flow as sacred waters that nurture the hearts, souls and minds of future being. Those spiritual warriors, bodhisattvas, prophets, wild women and men call to stand up on behalf of our beloved earth. Oh, thank you, Paula. I miss you so much. Your beautiful work for the world. What a gift for us and something to learn from and believe in, in these times of conflict and perhaps more conflict coming around this election season. I'm going to pause for a moment here and invite people to um, offer us questions in the chat. And I'll show you a few slides as we do that. They just take a minute or two, but these are images that many of the authors sent in for our first book launch. And you'll just see, without any real narration, where this work has gone. So during those couple of minutes, send us your questions. I can certainly ask a few and we'll hear from our participants for a few minutes. And then in about uh, 15 minutes, we'll hear from Joanna. So um, here's me sharing the screen and we get to see this images while you send in your questions. The work of our time. Just just take a look at it and enjoy where all this has happened. You'll see beneath each photo the caption that indicates what chapter is written by and what location from that author. How far this work has stretched. To brothers and sisters all around the world. To people in places that have also been burned by fires. Also struggling with climate change. also torn by conflict. Also trying to make progress towards waking up in some of the most difficult areas. Speaking across generations has been central to all of Joanna's work and so the teachers have carried it to the young ones, to the teenagers just trying to find some basic orientation and grounding in their crazy world. In this beautiful elm dance, we call out the names of those we care about, our concerns, we wish them their blessing of the dance itself. And even the young people can do this truth mandala. They want to speak from their hearts. And some of the most innovative work is now taking place in Latin America, here in Mexico. Also Chile, with Adrian, and across the world, brand new, really, in China, just in the last year or two. And right in smoke-filled Oakland. Many people know the trust walk, but imagine it here in Colombia, war torn for so many years.
So thank you, all of our panelists. So much richness. I feel moved to tears by many of you, honestly. Um, oh, let's hope that we have some uh, good um, questions here in our chat. And uh, let me see what we've got. Um, of course, there's always the kinds of question about how do we work to wake people up? It's an endless project. Um, and I'm also interested if any of you would like to speak to how this work is going to evolve in today's world. Where is it going to go? Where is it most needed? How will today's realities like the pandemic accelerate uh, our realization for waking up? I think that might be enough to get us going. Um, whoops. So would, who would like to address that? Just unmute yourself and join in. In fact, you could all unmute yourselves so that you'd be ready to add your comments as you like. Well, I was, okay. one thing I'm learning, one thing I'm learning and working in this country now is that we have to know each other to wake up to each other's realities. I've been working on a project between the liberal enclave of Massachusetts and a coal mining community in Kentucky, in Trump territory. And we've been having three-day dialogue residential exchanges and extremely far apart on so many issues and now profoundly connected in our hearts. But it wasn't until the knowing each other that we could begin to wake up together. And so part of what happens with the polarization is the walls are so high we can't find each other anymore and figuring out how in this country we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to get through these walls and find the others who become enemies to us. Because if we don't wake up together, we can't rebuild together. And for me, it's so much of it is in the I thou of building relationships across the divides. I, I, I like to share that, um, you know, obviously all of us, I think all of us on this Zoom can recognize that when we do the work uh, of, for the world, um, we wake up to each other through profound love and friendship. I mean, you know, as, as um, uh, horrific as uh, plutonium is, it has brought some of the most extraordinary, beautiful people in my life to me. And I would be remiss not to mention my brother, Christopher Hormel, who's been a huge part of the Nuclear Guardianship Project and really helped bring that into being vis-a-vis um, -vis Rocky Flats and Naropa. So, you know, these, these friendships grow in us, have us grow. So when we wake up together, we share our profound love for each other and extend that to our work in the world. I think being forced to um, do so much of uh, our education, our communication with one another, uh, and, and just the carrying on of the work of the world through um, the internet and the digital screen and these very rarefied ways that um, where we're not sharing the same breath. Um, I, I hope and pray that this is uh, uh, bringing a renewal, a renewed awareness, a replenished sense of, ah, how delicious contact is, how much I need touch with my sisters and mm -hmm. brothers, how much my senses need to be met by the whole panoply of textures and colors and tastes of this world. So I am praying that even as we, you know, as we conduct so much of our lives and get used to zooming hither and yon, that as it becomes possible, um, we will creep back out of this uh, cyberspace universe with an, an, a new sense of the primacy and the profound importance of place and sensorial um, encounter in the thick of the real with one another yes but also with the plants with the other critters with the sky and with the ground that something about 
about that is what I'm learning each day. Janine, do you have something yeah. to offer? Yeah. Sure, yeah, and I was also um, looking at a question that Christy also just posted that um, connected with all of this, but just really um, what's been coming up with, for me so strongly is the need for practice right now and to kind of go back to the basics of um, having some sort of um, grounding practice every day and noticing how deeply I can spin out um, with um, the stories, um, fear about like stability, um, the narratives around um, politics and the violence and aggression that's going on. And also um, in some places with being quarantined, the tight spaces that um, sometimes it feels isolated and then sometimes when you're around your immediate um, people you're in quarantine it can feel um, craziness as well um, especially on days when you can't go outside because the air quality is so bad and so really um, diving into that practice and remembering that that is something that will um, bring some sort of reflection and um, availability of being uplifted when I am feeling um, depressed, um, really sad. And uh, one of the things I've just really been focusing on is um, similar to what David was just talking about. And so many people have mentioned of um, being the practice to be quiet enough to listen to non-human voices to get some sort of guidance. You know, I'd like to highlight some of the words that all of you mentioned so we can turn to Joanna just to bring them back, that this is healing work that we're trying to do, that even when we do spin out and get caught in the cycle of anxiety or fear or frustration, that we return to the, what's healing. We were re trying to return to waking up through this work, the core of the work, as Paula said. And at the heart of it is a beautiful reciprocity that David highlighted for us to never forget that. The most grounding thing is watching the gift move back and forth. And when we can't breathe, remembering how precious a miracle it is that we have heart and lungs that can, that do know how to breathe over so many hundreds of thousands of years have figured this out. So these words, these ideas can be grounding uh, places to return to when we are struggling with all the forces drawing us away. Our own private rituals, our shared ritual, the gift of each other's friendships. So I just want to say we've received some beautiful thank yous in the, in the chat and we wouldn't want to complete this program without turning to our, our beloved mentor. So always, of course, Joanna gets the last word. And in fact, in the book, she did the afterword. But now, Joanna, how do you see this book? The world is such a different place than where we were on your 91st birthday. And even the year before that, when you wrote the afterword. What, what do you have to say for us, Joanna? Please unmute and join us and the rest of us will mute again yes well here i am in a very smoky uh day and several days uh with the air quality way up nearing 200 and the in this land of the ohlone and miwok uh around san francisco bay and i would imagine i can't imagine they who know knew so well how to work with Brother Fire, how to use fire in such uh, clearing, healing, help to manage their beautiful park-like lands as the, they were described. Uh, so here I am having been uh, locked up 
for two days mm -hmm. since coming back and I have never felt so in touch so glad I'm in a highly peopled world with so much communication and with my uh, heart leaping and uh, a sense of I almost feel your arms around me my dear brother and sisters this has been so uh, yes, a sense of exquisite reciprocity that you have found uh, usefulness in the work that you've connected and that and took the time and energy to connect with my offerings to connect with you and then that you would each out of the gifts of your uh, trained minds and your animal minds and your being, your ec ecstatic connection with the world and your brave, uh, excuse me. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> let me just close the door. Okay. That uh, you would, would give me so much to, um, uh, uh, bring me back to life <laughs> after sitting this and that uh, first of all that that um, I, it's a sense that I have uh, with David uh, listening to you and, and as uh, as I did that very first time we uh, met at the Deep Ecology Summer School though you told me it wasn't the first time but is a sense that you uh, enlivened for me a holographic experience of my own life fully vibrating to, responsive to uh, the uh, many uh, interweavings of uh, voices and pulses and colors and calls of our world. Uh, and I'm now, you know, that becomes stronger for me. You won't be surprised to know it in my 92nd year. Uh, it's beautiful to experience how my body mind uh, twangs and twitters <laughs> to a more uh, to in responsiveness to the natural world and to the love I experience coming toward me as if in earlier moments of my life I must have been wearing a suit of armor or something. I feel so newborn all the time with hardly any skin, skin at all. And then, uh, and, and Kathleen, oh my dear sister, uh, darling one, I remember so well that first meeting and how we stepped together with such uh, into deep time together. Remember how learning to care for the poison fire brought us for the sake of the future, brought us into uh, such a resonating both with the future generations and the past. And it gave us the a uh, sense of a deep time that you then took out in your work with the high school. Um, you, your gift to so many young high school students and then on through the years, not first yourself and then the hibakusha that you brought from Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So all of that was in my uh, heart when I was listening to you in Cleveland and my warmest wishes for your father. And then, oh, Janine, <laughs> you know, one of the reasons I, I just loved going to Naropa was that just seeing your face, seeing you, and you often came and sat in on uh, some, at least some of the uh, talks and classes that I did of like, any given course. I could count on that. Seeing you sitting there knitting and uh, 
and I was so happy that you sent me that lovely scarf that of one that you had knit for me in the class and that you wove together the um, multicultural self with the ecological self. And that has uh, strengthened me. Oh, my dear ones, you do strengthen me. I'm the luckiest person. Yes. And then, Paul, you are a guest. This is so wonderful to see how you are. Because uh, you, I think you, you, you know, Paul, I think you were in my first workshop. Not the one out here, but the one, uh, the vet very first. We met at Temenos when you were inventing despair work with Joe and Teresina. That's oh, how far that's back it goes. Oh, that's right. That's 1980 or something, Joanna. That's right. It was before that. Yeah. It was before that. Yeah. Yes. All right. That's best. And, we, go back and to. we were took Doug Clay out of the uh, stream yep. to yep. make our little egos. Yep. And we danced the dance to dismember the ego. We were trying to figure that out. Yep. And in, in the Tibetan dance, I'd watched how there was one ego in a three-sided uh, box with open box, mm -hmm. each side representing the greed, hatred, and delusion that held the ego together. Well, in that, remember how everyone, <laughs> this was in the USA, everyone wanted to make their own ego. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> What else is new? <laughs> we learned we learned to laugh at the ego. That was what our our contribution to do. Anyways, uh, I heard this morning a lovely, and it wasn't the first, a young woman who had uh, who's a teacher, and she's teaching at at Berkeley High School. So I know her, and uh, and she. I uh, had moved with a young man she'd fallen in love with back to the East Coast to Philadelphia. And she could teach by Zoom as well from Philadelphia as from uh, West Berkeley. But she said what she every day she is reading a chapter of a wild love for the world. And that this <laughs> and she's not the first who has told me that. So my dear beloved writers uh, in this book, you have made something so, and you and I also to the one I bow to the editor to, uh, you didn't expect you'd be writing, contributing to a devotional book, but <laughs> I love to think of uh, this marvelous book that, I can hardly believe is is even though it's been out for uh, what five months is is that it still is there and that it will continue and that it will uh, give people a feeling of the many ways the many ways. Uh, so we have a pandemic. So we have a crazy president. So we have uh, things falling apart. So, but all of that we can handle if we trust each other. All of that we can handle if we're not afraid to love. And if we're not afraid to love, then we're not afraid to fa fail either if we give everything. And that's what I feel now more and more that people are ready to give, ready to love. I've just completed my early at the beginning of the week, my first sermon for Yom Kippur. I felt so pleased to be able to, to, to be invited. I've always wanted to be part of a tradition that would devote a, a whole, holy day 
to wanting to shape up and be forgiven and self-forgive so that you can pull yourself together and do what you really deeply want to do. And it's coming clearer to me that we really do want to love. We're sick of, sick of the mess we've made. There's a huge appetite to just get done with this and wash ourselves off and link arms together. And there's such an eagerness for this that I'm feeling that we're uh, going to give it our all. We're trying to trust. And we'll do it. We're trying so hard we won't be afraid. We won't be afraid to love and we won't be afraid to fail. That seems to me what I most want. Oh, thank you, dear ones, for linking arms with each other across the miles, for being in this moment across hundreds of miles and thousands. And you live in, you'll just, you're always in my heart right here. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Joanna. I feel we could listen to you a long time. It's a thrill to be with you. Thank you for being with us tonight, our panelists, and also being with all our audience that has joined us. And of course, we're all thanking you for this many wonderful years of good thinking and good work in this world for our earth and all beings. Um, thank you to our four book authors and panelists. It's been a delight to be together in spirit anyway as part of this book launch event. I also want to close by thanking Christopher Hormel and the Calliopeia Foundation for funding support for the book and for book events programming. We've been so appreciative of that support. And also mention the book would never have been possible without our marvelous editor, Matt Zeppelin, and all the team at Shambhala Publications. They love this book and it was a joy to work with everyone there. And a special thanks to Sean Goodman, who, who managed the tech aspect of this and some other members of the Naropa uh, team. And for hosting us, Sherry Elms. So let me hand it back to Sherry for our last words. Thank you, everyone. And just as you hand it back, I want to give a special thank you to and a hug to you, Sherry. What you've given both to me and to the Joanna Macy Center uh, is, uh, lives in my heart and kindles such a deep gladness in you and your life. Mm. But I don't see her. Oh, I bet she's here somewhere. <laughs> Sherry, talk to us, Sherry. Well, well, we here I am. <laughs> there she is. Uh, Joanna, um, you break my heart. <laughs> so um, you're so much a part of who I have become and who I continue to be. And um, the times you've come into my classes at Naropa, the times I've spent with you in, in Berkeley, and, and I just, um, you're my mentor, you're my teacher, and every time I go into despair, I remember your work and I remember you and just the incredible joy that you seem to exude at 91. <laughs> you're writing, you keep writing books and I, I, just, I just can't thank you enough for being in my life. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> And I want to thank all of the panelists, certainly Stephanie, for having the inspiration and commitment to, to, to come, come together with this book. It wouldn't have happened without you. And I just feel like the dance is just um, going to continue on. Uh, and, and I hope so, uh, and thank you for all the people who are participating. I just wish I could hug you all because I know so many of you, but I truly do feel a connection in spite of, um, the tech, no, I would say maybe because of the technology, we're having to communicate and connect with each other in a different way, in a different way. So, um, gosh, I don't want to say goodbye, but we do have to do that. It's so <laughs> <laughs>
and uh, and if, if it, and just to say also that uh, if if people want to know more about the Joanna Macy Center at Naropa or um, Naropa in general, there's a little there's there's some links here. And as I said before, this whole event will be public, and it will be uh, free, so you can listen to it again and tell anybody who missed it that they can they can join us. So. Uh, I don't know how to end. Can we just maybe maybe touch our hearts and uh, and and bow to each other? Love, love, love. <laughs> <laughs>